Well, hello and welcome to the last of our midweek messages on the theme that we have from John chapter 17, Jesus' high priestly prayer. This is Jesus' high priestly prayer number three, and we're looking at verses 20 to 26. You might be wondering why I'm in this different location. Well, it's a combination of reasons. Um, firstly, because it's a beautiful place and I enjoyed doing my sermon preparation here. Uh, secondly, because it's a quiet place that's away from uh, the distractions of all the different things that, that uh, happen at home. And thirdly, actually, because there's a glorious view, a beautiful horizon and majestic wind turbines turning in the background. And uh, you'll see as we look at this passage that that's actually really relevant and I'm hoping that it's, a, it's an image that will stay with you as we look at it. Let's pray as we turn to the passage. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this wonderful prayer. We thank you that you prayed for us before you left this earth. And thank you that you prayed amazing things. I pray that you'd help us to understand what they mean for us now and for the future, that we would see the glorious horizon that you have planned for us and ways in which you want us to serve you and live for you in a way that impacts the world around us. Help us to put it into practice. Speak to us by your spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. So let's read the passage. It's John chapter 17, verses 20 to 26. In my Bible, it says that it's Jesus praying for all believers at the top of the passage. So verse 20, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they, that they may be one, as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them, and will continue to make you known, in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. And so we come to the third part of this prayer, and this is where Jesus turns his prayer and his attention to those who would believe in the message of his apostles, the disciples. And I guess that means us. We are those who have believed the message because others have told us. We are the ones that Jesus is praying for specifically at this point and what a wonderful thought that Jesus on the night before he died prayed for us he prayed for me he prayed for you and I just want to start with that amazing thought Jesus prays for us specifically individually for us and I think there are three things in here that I want us to particularly see and the first is that he prays for unity. We see that in verses 20 and 21 particularly. He says that they may be one as you and I, Father, are one. And then in verses 22 to 23, we see that he talks about the glory that his Father has given him. And so I feel that as... The first thing, the unity is established and extended. Secondly, that glory identifies believers and demonstrates 
who they are to the world. And thirdly, that they should come to complete intimacy with Jesus and with the Father. There's a, there's a completion and a consummation of this big theme that runs all the way through that of unity. So let me say that again. Unity that is established and extended. Glory that identifies believers and is demonstrated. And thirdly, a complete intimacy that is completed and consummated. So let's look at these three things. I want to ask a few questions of each one of them as we go through. Um, so the first question is who? Who is this unity for? We'll look at verse 20. It says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. Being one is not just for random individuals or a few believers it's for all believers that all of them may be one Jesus wants all Christians all who trust in him all those who believe in the message to be one and how is this unity created how is it established and extended well it reflects and it's a participation in the union that there is between the Father and the Son. Jesus says, Just as you are in me, and I am in you. You see, Jesus and the Father are one. They live and always have lived since the creation of the world, and throughout Jesus' earthly ministry and beyond into the future, they live in perfect unity and in love. Jesus lives in obedient submission to the Father. The Father pours his love and his approval on the Son. You remember right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, the Father spoke over him, This is my beloved Son. With him I am well pleased. Even before he had done anything, the Father demonstrates his approval and his love and Jesus says I am always doing what the Father shows me he is listening to the Father he is following him he is obeying him there's this continual union of love and the Father is in the Son and the Son is in the Father and so our unity should be the same with the Father and the Son and also with each other that submission of love and obedience and that honoring and that approval that should mark us out as believers not only in our relationship with God the Father and Jesus the Son but in our relationship with one another so how does that happen well I believe it's through the Holy Spirit and we have that beautiful kind of synergy of all three parts of the Trinity working together. By his Holy Spirit, Jesus comes to dwell within us. It's the Spirit of Jesus who lives in us, who, through whom um, the Spirit testifies to the Father's love. The same love that the Father has for Jesus, he has for us. And that Spirit lives within us, testifying to the Father's love and enabling us to obey and submit. And that in turn releases the approval of the Father. And that same love should cause us to love each other within the church. And so why is all of this the case? Why does this happen? Well, Jesus himself says, so that the world may believe that you sent me, Father. So why should we show unity? So that the world, those people around us who do not know God, might believe that Jesus is the one sent by the Father. So our unity with each other should lead to others putting their faith in Jesus. There's an enormous challenge. So what 
does that look like for us? I want you to consider, um, maybe we'll discuss this in the small groups. What would that look like in the small group? How do you show unity and love one for each other? What does that look like in our church? And just stopping there, let's just think about that. Surely what that means is there should not be any kind of cliques or division. There shouldn't be any difference regardless of um, social background or ethnicity or gender or any other dividing wall that might be put up between us. Those things should be gone. The church should be a place where everyone is welcome. Everyone is equally valued and everyone is loved. It should be the most diverse community on earth um, and actually a place where people are most welcome and most loved. What a challenge. And actually, although Jesus doesn't say this here, um, it's very clear that what this means is, is if those things are not present, then that does not glorify Jesus. And it stops the world believing. It's a barrier to belief. Wherever there is division in the church, you know how sad that we have splintered off into so many different denominations and different groups. Um, and those things prevent others from believing in Jesus. If we want people to believe that Jesus was sent by God, that he is the Messiah, that he is the saviour of the world, then we need to be united. It's not un unity at the expense of truth. The truth of the gospel matters and we shouldn't water down the key truths of the gospel. However, where there are true believers, there should be unity. Unity over those key truths. And we should leave aside our divisions that uh, are kind of on the periphery of our faith. Those things that don't really matter, just our style choices, to be honest. There's a challenge. And what about unity beyond the walls of our own church? How we are demonstrating love to other Christian communities. Where does all of that start? Well, it starts in our relationship with Jesus. That loving submission to him. Ask yourself this question, what does it mean to be in him? To be in Jesus? As Jesus is in the Father, are we in Jesus? Are we in loving union with him? Do we walk with him day by day in love? opening ourselves up to him and his spirit. So that's the first point. The second thing is looking at verses 22 and 23. Jesus talks about his glory. He says this in the context of this oneness. It kind of follows on sequentially in a, in a way that Jesus clearly links them together. And he says this, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. See, glory leads to unity, it says. And in them, sorry, I in them, and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. And then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. So when is this glory given? It says this, verse 22, I have given them. The glory it's already done so if you are a Christian today you have already received the glory of Jesus you share in his glory as the father has given glory to the son so the son gives glory to you if you are a believer and how is this glory given well it reflects what the father gives to the Son. That same glory is given to us. What does that glory look like? We've already expressed 
this idea of loving union between the Father and the Son. That is glorious. Nowhere else is that seen. There's a glory to this love and oneness that Jesus experiences with the Father. But it's also demonstrated in the miraculous signs. Throughout the Gospel of John, there are, there are seven signs that Jesus performs. Signs of the coming kingdom. Signs of heaven breaking in on earth. And it's that same glory that Jesus demonstrates. And he passes on to those who follow him. There will be miraculous signs, supernatural gifts given to those who follow Jesus. And then there is the honour that the Father bestows upon the Son. And that same honour from the Father is bestowed by Jesus upon his believers. And then there's the glory of Jesus' final exaltation, that uh, he who humbled himself and became obedient to death on the cross will be exalted above every other name. He is glorious and reigns above all. And Jesus invites us into that same glory that we can reign and rule with him. There is a future glory. So not only is this a, a glory that's already been given, but it's a future glory that we will experience with him. And, and that's kind of why I'm out here with this wonderful horizon, because Jesus sees... Uh, kind of far off in the horizon, the glory of those who will come to believe in him and be exalted with him in the future. We will rise to be with him and reign with him forever. And we will share in his glory. So there is a glory that Jesus gives demonstrates this oneness because if we are participating with Jesus if, if, if our relationship with him is one of unity and union then not only will we participate um, in his love but we will participate in his glory we will participate in what he comes to bring we will participate in his mission to the world we participate in everything we are in Christ as Paul so frequently says in the book of Ephesians, um, we are in him and therefore we also are seated with him in the heavenly realms, as it says in Ephesians, that we will participate in his glory. Why is it that Jesus gives his glory from the Father to us? Well, it's so that the world might know that same love that we talk about here. The world will know that you sent me and that you have loved them even as you have loved me. You see, the glory that we have, the glory, glorious nature of the church, the glorious nature of believers, identifies us as his. We are identified and it demonstrates that this unity must only have come from Jesus. And finally, the intimacy. This is verses 24 to 26. Jesus says this, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. So where is this intimacy to be found? Well, it is with Jesus where he is. And we know that yes, he's going to be crucified and then raised to, um, to new life. And there is a sense in which um, believers kind of travel through that too with Jesus. But then he is going to be ascended and raised to the right hand of the Father. And that is where he is going to be and where he wants his followers to go, to be with him. There's a kind of consummation and a completion. This is a, a kind of future glory and a future intimacy that starts now, but that is finally fully revealed in eternity. Jesus wants us to be with him. What a wonderful idea. 
when you get married to somebody, when you fall in love with somebody, that's what you want. You want intimacy that is consummated on your marriage day, on your wedding day. That intimacy is sealed and consummated. And that's what Jesus is anticipating here. He sees on the horizon the glory that is to come where his disciples, those who have followed him, those who have loved him, um, will be united in true, perfect intimacy forever. Jesus wants you to be with him. Um, he says earlier in this discourse, um, I am going ahead of you to prepare a place for you in my Father's house. In my Father's house there are many rooms, and I will go and prepare a place for you. Jesus wants to be with you. Jesus loves you that much that he wants you to be with him and he prays to the father may they be with me where i am in other words in heaven in glory at the right hand of the father exalted and glorified with him in perfect union and intimacy what a wonderful thought and how does this happen well jesus says this i have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. There's a revelation that Jesus brings. When he came on earth and he, and he spent that time with his disciples on his earth, in his earthly ministry, he revealed the Father to them. He demonstrated this same loving union. They watched it happen. They saw the love that was in Jesus that came from the Father and that was given to them. So they got to know what the Father was like through knowing who Jesus was like. And Jesus reveals the Father to them. By the Holy Spirit, he opens their eyes to see what the Father is like, to see what Jesus himself, the Son, is like. And that same revelation he continuously gives to all those who believe in the message. Jesus is revealing himself by the Holy Spirit through Scripture, through his life on earth and through all that he continues to do as he stands at the right hand of the Father. He's wanting to reveal himself so that the Father might be known. So it's through revelation that this intimacy comes. And why? So that there might be a complete union. Intimacy of love that goes on forever and ever. So I hope you're thrilled and excited to know that Jesus is praying for you. That we can be one and we should seek to participate in that same union. The good news is that Jesus prayed for it and therefore it will happen. It may not happen right now, but it will happen one day. All believers will be united together under one head and we will worship every tribe and tongue and nation and people will gather and worship this wonderful Lord Jesus and there will be a wonderful intimacy and we will share in his glory. What a joyous day that will be. Jesus' prayer will be answered. Now let's be part of making it come true in our own lives that the world might see and believe and know this beautiful Saviour that we have. So I hope you're encouraged by those things. Um, and uh, look forward to discussing it in your groups together. Let's pray as we finish. Lord Jesus, we just want to praise you um, that you have this beautiful union and intimacy and love between yourself and the Father. And thank you that you enable us to share in that relationship that you have demonstrated your love to us as you died on the cross and that because of that we are welcomed in that we can be in Christ we can participate in the glory that is given by the Father to you and then to us and we can know this intimacy and love 
loving union with you forever. Lord, we long for that day when it is finally consummated. We long for that day when your people will finally be one. We long for that day when we will share in your glory. But we praise you that those things have begun in us and we pray that you would carry them on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Help us to work out with fear and trembling what, the, what that means for us right now and prepare for that great day when we enjoy those things with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So do enjoy um, discussing that in your groups. This is the last midweek message um, before the summer break. Um, I will be sending around some information to small group leaders, but we're hoping very much that people will participate in one of several different things that we're offering. Either the um, sermons from Christopher Ash in the Keswick Convention on the Book of Psalms, Hope Through Jesus, in Psalms 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. Alternatively, you can use some of the material from New Wine, lots of great material that we've put out, uh, that we'll send out in our summer suitcase of resources. And finally, another option is to look at a series called The Way, looking at different spiritual disciplines put out by John Ortberg and his church, Menlo Park, California. Um, some great material to work through, and it's for you to choose within your small group. May God bless you and uh, enjoy your discussions in your groups. Thank you.